When looking at naval history, we tend to focus on the powerful warships or the tragic ocean liners, often overlooking the more common and rugged merchant ships or ocean liners whose carriers thankfully avoided tragedy. Still, it does not mean that these ships with long lives and incredible stories don't end in their twisted misfortune or indignity. Take for example the SS United States, once a proud and powerful ocean liner, now rusted and forgotten in a Philadelphia dockyard. How did this proud flagship of the American Merchant Marine end up in such a state, and what's in store for her in the future? Join us to find out, as today we discover the history of the SS United States. I'm your host Ryan Sokash and you're watching It's History. In the aftermath of World War II, the status quo of oceanic travel was changed forever. While many navies and their merchant marines were left destitute by the havoc of war, the United States was enjoying its spoils and taking lessons for the possibility of future wars. Just as in the Great War, America was not prepared for the sheer number of men it needed to move across the seas to both the Atlantic and Pacific theaters. In the short term, it relied on allied navies and merchantmen to fill this role while building and commandeering other ships to use as troop carriers. To prepare for the next war, they knew they needed something else. For this endeavor, the Department of Defense approached the small but influential United States lines. For context, the group was created in 1917 to utilize and seize German cargo and passenger ships interned in the United States at the start of World War I. They started their tenure with the former German passenger ship Venterland, which was renamed SS Leviathan and served as a wartime troop ship, before being converted to a peacetime passenger liner kept by the company. They had weathered the interwar period and the Second World War and were chosen as the only logical tenure for this future ship. The Navy chose Francis Gibbs as the chief designer, a Philadelphia local and naval enthusiast from the age of eight. He went to study in Cambridge in 1906, carefully locking his dorm desk every time he left, in perhaps an irrational fear that his peers might see the young American studying in extreme depth the deck plans and blueprints for the latest British battleships. He was reserved, cautious, and a poor student despite his wealth of practical knowledge. He was so technically minded that when the French passenger liner Normandine made its first voyage to New York Harbor in 1935, he visited the vessel as an American tourist before bolting into a crew-only door at the first chance with one of his associates. They spent hours roaming and studying every classified corner of the ship, including the engine and boiler rooms, before ultimately being ejected. When they returned to their office, Gibbs spent three hours detailing the ship's construction to his business partner, Norman Zeppler, as he wrote down everything. Gibbs might have had a proper technical mindset for his work, but study and engineering did not come naturally to him. He likely could only enter Cambridge and later Harvard due to his father's deep pockets. Dissatisfied with his real estate law career, in 1915, in the heat of the Great War, he left the legal practice to study and apprentice himself under the leading American naval architect of the time, Admiral David Taylor, a core proponent and designer of the President Theodore Roosevelt's Great White Fleet. During and after the war, he truly excelled in shipbuilding and created the design and building firm Gibbs and Cox. Here, he demanded the best and only the best. In 1930, in the prelude to World War II, he was encouraged by FDR to design a new class of destroyer for the US Navy. The product was the Mahan class destroyer, of which 16 were built with the first high pressure high temperature steam turbines. They were the fastest destroyers built at the time, and their design philosophy would go on to inspire subsequent destroyers in the United States. Following the Mahan, they designed their half-sisters, the Gleaves class. Then the firm designed the modular cargo ship, 
the Merchant Marines EC2S C1 program, otherwise known as Liberty Ships. You can find more details about them in one of our previous videos. Anyhow, after that, and in coordination with Henry Kaiser, he designed the Casablanca class escort carriers. But it was after the war, in the early stages of the Cold War, that he would make what he believed was his masterpiece. The special operational combination of American military and civilian shipbuilding with Gibbs' sense of style, practicality, and caution, he created the absolute, one-of-a-kind SS United States. She weighed in at over 53 gross registered tons and was 302 meters long overall. Weight was saved by integrating a form of superstructure construction that had small to medium sized hulls and girders, beams, and plating built across the entire ship. This subtle innovation shaved valuable weight while keeping necessary stability and integrity. Now looking at aircraft and shipbuilding, this feature is commonplace, but the SS United States was the first civilian ship to feature it. Gibbs demanded to include other revolutionary innovations as well. You see, he had earned something of a reputation for safety standards dating all the way back to his work on the Leviathan, and he was hands-on in every aspect despite his lack of formal training. As a result, the United States was the first cruise ship to use safety glass all across the ship, providing added protection against both Atlantic and Pacific seasonal hard weather. The ship had an exclusively steel and aluminum construction, with no wood to be seen, even in the piano. A large part of the reason for this was his memory of the Normandine, which sank while interned in New York Harbor during World War II due to an out-of-control fire. Gibbs would let nothing start or feed a fire on his ship. The only wood anywhere on the ship was the butcher's block. In later years, Gibbs would accept the employment of mahogany on the piano, but only after a very notable demonstration by the ship's craftsmen. You see, they poured gasoline on the piano, lit it. The gasoline burnt out without the wood catching fire. Hence, Gibbs went very far with this, demanding fireproof fabrics in the passengers' rooms, and so on. Construction began in February of 1950, and the ship was launched on June the 23rd, 1951. By then, it had the majority of its engineering and electronics installed, including the two engine rooms, which were separated by watertight compartments. Its maiden voyage was the next month, starting on July the 3rd, and celebrating Independence Day at sea. She arrived in Cornwall on the 7th, beating the previous fastest eastbound liner crossing by more than 10 hours. This record was previously held by the RMS Queen Mary, and was a mark of pride for the United States line to now hold the world record. Even on her maiden voyage, the captain of the United States implied that the ship could have gone even faster. This isn't without debate though. You see, in 1991, after she was retired, author Mark Carbonero wrote that while the engines could carry the ship as high as 45 knots per hour, the speed was never achieved. A white paper published by John McCullen and Associates claimed that 45 knot speed was either never attainable or couldn't be achieved for more than a few minutes without heavily taxing and possibly damaging the engine room. Whatever the truth is, we do know that on her maiden voyage, the SS United States achieved an average speed of 35 knots and crossed the Atlantic in three days, 10 hours and 40 minutes, shattering British speed records for the same route. The rest of the 1950s would be the ship's heyday. She was a successful liner who hosted thousands over this period of her career including the Duke and Duchess of Windsor and Hollywood elite like Walt Disney or Marilyn Monroe. But good times don't last forever, and the 60s would rapidly change global trade. Owing to mutual British and American developments in jet aircraft, long-range flights across the Atlantic were now finally feasible in the 60s. After being tested all throughout the late 50s, Jets such as the British Comet and the Boeing 707 were rapidly making passenger liners obsolete. 
Things declined fast with RMS Queen Mary retiring in 1967 and the RMS Queen Elizabeth following her the next year. And so it was. Without any fanfare, the United States completed its final voyage to the UK in 1969. She returned unloaded for a planned overhaul. And while she was underway for the return trip, it was announced that the liner would be pulled from service. She was moved and laid up in a dry dock in Norfolk, Virginia, where work stood frozen for several years. The hull was halfway through a repaint, crew uniforms were still stored in their original quarters, and furniture and fittings were scattered across the entire ship. Through the 70s, three plans from buyers, including the United States Navy, came and went. Even when the ship's blueprints were declassified, none of these arrangements were ever approved. Even the proposal for the Navy to convert it into a permanent hospital ship was denied, as two San Clementine tanker ships were chosen instead. The developer Richard Hadley bought the ship for $5 million. Under his ownership, the ship's fittings and furnitures were auctioned off to pay creditors, a probable sign that his plans for the ship weren't going to work. And what were his plans? Well, he wanted to make the ship a timeshare apartment complex, of all things. This concept failed miserably, and the ship ended up being seized by the US Marshals Service. In 1992, it was auctioned off again for almost half of what Hadley had paid for it, which was almost a death sentence for the ship as it was towed from the East Coast to Turkey and later into Ukraine. Here it underwent the necessary asbestos removal from within the hull, but also the great majority of its internal steel and aluminum were removed. The ship was left as a husk with only the welded and bolted outlines of where rooms should be to tell visitors and inspectors its story. But that wasn't encouraging for investors, and in 1997, it was sold yet again for a $6 million sum. This time, owner Edward Cantor prioritized the creation of a preservation society for the ship and formed the twin organizations, SS United States Foundation and the SS United States Conservancy. Six years later, Canton was dead, and the ship was purchased by Norwegian Cruise Lines. They planned for the passenger ship to be refitted for cruises to and from Hawaii. On paper, they had a strong advantage due to American tax and commerce law demanding that any ship conducting national maritime commerce be built within the United States. Since so much of American shipbuilding slipped away to foreign countries between the 60s and modern day, Norwegian cruises thought that they had a sizable advantage to make the ship work. They determined that the ship was in decent condition and it was slated to be the fourth ship on their Hawaiian cruise registry. However, without explanation, it was withdrawn from this plan in 2009. This was most likely because of the tourism crash of the mid-2000s, but company records didn't publicly state the reason. The United States Conservancy then purchased the ship in 2011. After receiving partial funding from Philadelphia businessman H.F. Lenfest, the ship was purchased for $3 million this time and transited to Philadelphia, where it's been laid up ever since. The Conservancy announced a variety of plans from then to today. They wanted to develop the ship as a hotel or apartment complex in Philadelphia, New York Harbor, or even Miami. Those plans, as you guessed it, never materialized. The Philadelphia plan has been written off completely, regardless to hold their contract and grant together. Any refit that the ship receives must be made in the Philadelphia Navy Yard for the yard and the city's financial benefit. In February of 2016, Crystal Cruises proposed purchasing the ship for return to passenger and cruise services, but dropped out by August of that same year. However, as compensation for the fallen through deal, they provided the ship with a $350,000 donation for upkeep and docking fees. In 2018, they received an offer from the RXR Realty Group, which offered to purchase the ship and move it as an entertainment and hotel complex 
at Pier 57 in New York Harbor. This plan has so far stayed the most promising, although things remain quiet from the beginning of the negotiations to this very day. Even so, the deal has progressed much further than any of the previous ideas. As US Today wrote last June, Penn Warehousing and Distribution, the current owners of Delaware River Pier 82, where it's currently docked, filed a complaint to the Conservancy claiming that they're refusing to pay rent and that the long-term storage of the ship there has damaged the pier. However, when addressed by reporters, they said nothing else. The Conservancy respectfully replied that they would readily pay their previously agreed upon $850 rent fee for the pier, but that the sudden price hike enforced by Penn Warehousing is unfair and unaffordable for the ship without further donations. The Conservancy's current director, Susan Gibbs, granddaughter of Francis Gibbs, told US Today in that June 13th article that there is frankly, quote, no other American ocean liner left, and it is just so important to preserve our history as a nation. And as conservation manager Ray Griffiths said bluntly, everyone knows about the Titanic, right? It sank. That's why it's so famous. This ship did not. Gibbs has written that the ship has a few potential futures. They can develop it as a cruise ship and move it to New York City or the East Coast as a floating hotel, or they can sell it for scrap. She also said that if it came to that decision and the ship that her grandfather designed and that all of America had a hand in crafting was put in that position, if they were expelled from their current dock, they would rather sink her as a reef. She loves this ship. She probably loves it as much as Francis himself did. And she's taken several interviews with newspapers, magazines, and YouTube channels rallying to its defense and legacy. The SS United States isn't some unlucky or poorly designed ship that should be remembered for a tragedy at sea. To the contrary, she was just born a few years too late. As a country, America had sold off and scrapped too many beautiful ships. Kitty Hawk, the World War II and Cold War USS Enterprises, their smaller sisters as cruisers, destroyers, and submarines. And we've lost passenger ships too. Not one other American-built passenger ship from the transatlantic trade still exists. Think about that. Think about the thousands that were built from steel and wood, the sailing ships, the paddle wheelers, the coal burners, and modern oil-fired ships, none of them are left. How did we let that happen? How did we lose these memories and legacies of all of them? We've lost so many beautiful ships, failing the memories of our forefathers. Let's not add the SS United States to that list. Anyways, thank you guys for watching, and until next time, I'm Ryan Sokash, signing off.